So in the medieval times, typically every Christmas or Easter and, and sometimes other times, squires who had served for years learning the ins and outs and, and serving and uh, being educated on what it looked like to be a knight would be knighted by royalty, by kings or queens. They would kneel before the king or queen and they would be knighted and say, you now kneeled down a squire and you now get to rise up a knight. This happened on a, uh, on a, on a yearly basis in Easter, uh, Christmas, and sometimes in the throes of battle if a squire proved particularly brave. But that act of kneeling before a king or queen was an act of surrender. It was an act of, I am pledging all of my allegiance, I am pledging all that I have and all that I can do, and I'm surrendering it to you as king or as queen. I'm vowing to do all that I can to protect the kingdom. <clears throat> it's an act of surrender, that kneeling down before, because they're putting themselves in a place of vulnerability, right? Especially because a sword was used in the night, right? <laughs> so this is a specific <clears throat> act of surrender. Well, along with that surrender came some really kind of good things for knights, right? You go from a squire to being a knight, you now can own land. So there's monetary value that came with that surrender. But there was also um, the value of being able to hire soldiers to protect your family. That came with it. It came with the ability to, as internally as a man, to provide, right? It came with the ability as a person to say, I have value and I have worth. And I tell you all of that about knights and squires. You're like, Brady, where are you going? What is going on? I tell you that because in our text this morning, our aim is simply this. We are changed by God when we surrender our lives to God. I wanted to paint a picture of you that we oftentimes would understand of this act of surrender. Because you and I are changed by God when we surrender our lives to God. And in Genesis chapter 17, we're going to see Abram's name is changed, and then we're going to see the response that God gives us of Abram. So look with me, Genesis 17, starting in verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, now let's just stop for a second. 99. All right? So, 99 years. Now think about this. When Abram is called by God for the first time, he's 75. He's 75 years old when he's called by God to leave everything and to go, and he does. He is now 99 years old. Some 24 years later, the Lord appears to Abram. 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Now, again, we're gonna stop here. When Abraham, 24 years later, now, right, what has God told Abram? Hey, I want you to pick everything, everything you have up and I want you to leave and I want you, I'm gonna, I want you to go to a land that I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna make you great, Right? 24 years later, God says, hey, Abram, I need you to walk before me, blameless. But God does something here. Because God's original <clears throat> introduction to Abram 
is said, he is Lord. This is the, the term that we use for, if you've ever heard the, phrase, the, the, the Hebrew term Yahweh. This is who God reveals himself to be at the beginning of this journey, this relationship he has with Abram. That says, I am Lord. I am Yahweh. I'm the God of relationship. And he begins this relationship with Abram. And 24 years later, now God's going to reveal himself further to Abraham. Okay, listen to what he says. I am God Almighty. Or as you may have heard it before, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. God is telling Abram, there is no other besides me. I am God. And he is declaring this and revealing him, his character and his nature even further to Abraham. This is who I am. I am the God of relationship, but I am God Almighty. And he declares this to Abram, and he reveals himself even further to Abram. But then he's going to go on and he says this. He asks him to walk before me and be blameless that I may make, make, may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Verse 3. Then Abram fell on his face. And Abram fell on his face. I'll stop there. Like, man, Brady, this is going to take forever. No, I just want you to see these few things real quickly as we start, right? See, our lives are changed when we sur by God when we surrender our lives to God. Abram hears this from God, and Abram's first and only response in this moment is to do what? Fall on his face. Fall on his face. This is an act of surrender, an act of, I'm all yours. I, see, they're watching it online. I, <laughs> thanks, Robbie, that was perfect, right? There's this act in this moment of surrender that happens in Abram's life, right? He surrenders before the Lord, but then watch what happens when he surrenders. It's the name change. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Verse 8, And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Here's the crazy thing. Abram's act of surrender to God leads to a changed life, right? Namely, his name, right? He goes from Abram to Abraham. Now, let me ask you this, church people, those of you that have grown up in church, what name do you remember most when you remember the story of this? Abram or Abraham? Abraham, right? Why? Because God changed who he was. Right? God changed who he was. He goes from Abram to Abraham through his act of surrender to the one and only King, God Almighty, El Shaddai. And so this morning, I, I want to ask us this question. How has God changed you? How has God changed you? See, we may not go through a name change, right? But Scripture is very clear that says that when we step into relationship with Jesus, when we admit and we surrender and, and, and say and declare that Jesus came to this earth, the Son of God, 
lived a perfect life, and then died on the cross for your sins and for my sins, put in a tomb, and three days later, he rose from that tomb and conquered death. When we surrender to that truth and we put our trust and our faith and we declare that he is Lord, what happens is scripture says that the old life is gone and we are given a new life. That the old heart is put away and we are given a new heart. That there's a change that happens in you and I when we step into relationship with El Shaddai, with God Almighty. There's a change that happens in you and me. So how has God changed your life? Do you look different today than you did before you stepped into a relationship with Jesus? Because when we surrender our lives to God, we are changed by God. He begins to shape and change who we are. Is it overnight? Absolutely not. It takes time. It is a process. As we spend daily time with Yahweh, Lord, and we continue daily to surrender to Him, there's a change that happens in you and me. And I begin to find my worth and my value in Him, not in the world. And I begin to find my hope in Him and not my circumstance. And I began to find my joy and my peace in him and not what's happening in life. And I began to get to a place where I turn on the news and I hear everything that's happening and go, God's still good. And he's still on his throne. And he's still in control of all things. And hallelujah, he's coming back one day. And he's going to make it all right. And because of that, I can take joy. So when we surrender our lives to God, we are changed by God. Because that's God's faithfulness, isn't it? How many of you can sit here this morning and say, I can attest to the faithfulness of God. He has been faithful to me over and over again, even when I didn't understand. Come on. Yes. If you're not a believer here this morning, all you had to do is look around. There's so many people in this room that can say that despite my circumstance, he is faithful. Despite what's going on in my life, he is faithful. Despite the scariness of, of maybe being called to Nigeria, he is faithful. Because that's the character and nature of God. And God is revealing that to Abraham over and over and over again. This is who I am. He's called us to surrender to him. So we see the name change, but then we also see this. We see a response. Verse 9, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or, or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is brought <clears throat> with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. And un any circumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so God provides a symbol of saying, here's your response to the covenant relationship. Abraham, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you the, the father of many nations. 
and I'm going to be faithful. And this is my promise in this covenant relationship. But Abraham, here's what you're going to do. And he lays that out. And he says, this is, a, this is a sign in which you and your people will be and say, this is what we will do in the covenant relationship. And here's the symbol that says it and declares to the whole world that we belong to El Shaddai. And he asks for a response. And Abraham does that. But listen, circumcision was a, a symbol to show the world that they belonged to God. And so for you and I, as believers in Christ, as ones who say, hey, we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, there's some symbols that we practice today to declare to the world we belong to Jesus. The first thing that we practice, the first symbol to declare that is baptism. Is that we um, believe in believer's baptism. That means that we believe that when you make the decision and the choice to put your faith and trust in Jesus and surrender your life to him, then you can get into the baptismal waters and declare to the whole world that the old has passed away and the new has come. It is a sign declaring to the world, I belong to Jesus. And then after that, the sign that we participate in is this, the Lord's Supper. For us as believers to remember, to declare to ourselves, to our church family and to the world that we remember the sacrifice that was made for us. You see, this covenant that God makes with Abraham is a sign to the whole world that they belong to him. And so we do the same thing today in a different way to declare to the world we belong that we are in covenant relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And nothing else matters. Because listen to me, church, at the end of all of your days, whenever that comes, there's nothing else that matters other than the choice you made in your relationship with God. Nothing. All the things that you can accumulate all the things that you can do at the end of the day when, when all is said and done and you stand before the holy of holies and you stand before the king and the creator of the universe literally nothing else matters other than the relationship the choice you made about the relationship with that king with that lord with the creator of the universe And so when we, as a body, in just a few moments, take this supper together, we are declaring, I've put my faith, my trust, in Jesus and Jesus alone. And I've surrendered all that I am to him. And so by doing, we allow our lives to be changed by him. Abraham was different from this moment on. Next week, we're going to look at the faithfulness of the promise that he made to him in the birth of Isaac. And then the last week in January, we get to look at the obedience of Abraham when God calls him to sacrifice Isaac. But this morning, as we move into a time of invitation, before we tip or take, I would ask you this. Have you made a decision about your relationship with Jesus? If you have, 
I'm thankful for that. If that's you this morning, I would ask that during the invitation that you make sure that your heart is right before the Lord before we take of this. That you just ask the Lord to to reveal to you anything that you need to ask and plead for forgiveness for, lest you take this in vain. If this morning you're saying that, hey, I, I need for the first time to put my faith and trust in Jesus, we're going to have a moment of invitation that you can come down and you can do that. And we would invite you to come. God asks and calls for our surrender. May we give that to him this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that you would just continue to move in our hearts. Father, as we move into this moment of invitation, Father, that you would work and that you would move in hearts. And Father, as we take this supper together, Father, would we be reminded of the sacrifice that was made for us on the cross. Father, we love you. Be with us in these moments. In your name we pray. Amen.